This is Rick Rule. The purpose of this interview is at once to understand the company, but also to uh, understand how the company was built and ascertain whether the lessons that the management teams uh, learned building these successful companies are applicable to their own investment strategies and can in fact be employed by the listeners in understanding how to invest their own money. Uh, with the disclaimer out of the way, out of the way, uh, let's begin the interview. I'm delighted this morning to be interviewing Sebastian de Montesieu. Uh, he has suggested that in the in, in the interest of my not embarrassing myself by continuing to try to pronounce his name, that I uh, address him as Seb. So understand that addressing him in Seb is not meant as any disrespect to the person I'm interviewing, but rather uh, an uh, admission of my own uh, uh, inability to pronounce certain types of name. Seb, thank you, first of all, from saving me from further embarrassment. And thank you too, for subjecting yourself to this interview uh, and coming to the Natural Resources Investment Symposium. Welcome. Good morning, Rick, and thank you very much, I mean, for having me you know, this morning on this podcast. I had the good fortune uh, about a month ago uh, to be at a conference in Zurich where I, uh, had the opportunity to uh, interview your company, but also sit in the presentation. And I have to say, uh, I, I came back uh, very cheerful from that interview. I've been uh, an investor uh, in uh, Endeavor uh, and Semifo, for that matter, one of the constituents for a very long time. But you always feel better uh, refreshing your memory as to why you invested. And I must say, you did a great job. Uh, your whole team did a great job in Zurich. I'm going to begin by asking you to give us a reasonably brief uh, overview of Endeavor. I understand that your company by now is large enough that an overview could take an hour. We don't have an hour. So tell us what it, <clears throat> pardon me, what it is that you do better than other people, where you focus, how you've built the company. Sure. Thanks, Rick. Well, um, saying in a very uh, uh, short uh, time frame. I mean, the best way to present Endeavor is probably by saying that uh, we are one of the um, top 10, 12 uh, largest gold producer. Um, one of the unique part of uh, Endeavor Mining is that uh, we are focused geographically into one region, uh, which is West Africa. And the reason why we are operating in West Africa is simply because it's uh, uh, it's quite unknown, but uh, from a geological standpoint, it's probably the most uh, undiscovered uh, region uh, for gold in the world. Uh, it's been behind China, currently the second largest production region for gold. And over the last 10 years, it's been the most prolific in terms of discoveries. The reason for that is uh, the Bohemian Greenstone Belt, which is this uh, you know, specific geological uh, belt uh, across the different countries in West Africa where we operate, uh, mainly French West African countries. Uh, we currently have about six mines. Um, we did... Uh, a big part of uh, you know, Endeavor when I joined in 2016 uh, was about um, growing the portfolio, uh, but growing the portfolio with smart assets uh, and uh, smart assets that uh, we had in the portfolio to build. Uh, so we did a lot in exploration, in construction. Uh, we did build in uh, 17 and 18 two key projects in a row, uh, Hyundai in Burkina Faso and ET in Côte d'Ivoire, uh, which are key assets for the portfolio. And then uh, we entered into a consolidation phase, you know, throughout COVID, uh, acquiring Semafo uh, in Canada, uh, which had assets in, uh, in particular in Burkina Faso, but also just after that, Taranga Mining, uh, which had an amazing asset in Senegal and also in Burkina Faso. Uh, so we're currently producing about 1.5 million ohms. Uh, we are one of the lowest uh, producer in terms of uh, audience sustaining cost, production cost. Uh, you know, we aim at uh, staying around 900 or below 900 uh, in terms of audience sustaining cost. Uh, we're generating, therefore, in current environment, significant cash flow. Uh, and uh, this allowed us in uh, July, June last year, uh, to, on top of our UK listing, uh, sorry, Canadian listing, uh, to list also in London. Uh, and uh, back in March, uh, we entered the FTSE 100 uh, on the back of also geopolitical crisis for uh, our dear uh, Russian uh, you know, gold companies. Um, so... In a nutshell, you know, a small energetic company uh, trying to focus geographically on uh, on West Africa, uh, with headquarters in uh, in London and all the rest of the team, you know, based in West Africa. So let's go a little deeper here. First of all, some of the basics. <clears throat> Pardon me. 
what is your market capitalization? Do, do you have any debt? Uh, if so, uh, what's the approximate enterprise value? Uh, and how does uh, EBIT relate to that market capitalization? Let's get some value, value parameters in here. Sure. So in terms of uh, uh, market cap, we are about uh, close to $7 billion Canadian dollar uh, or you know, 4.5, 4.7 4 sterling, uh, depending on which currency you want to use. Um, in terms of, uh, um, I would say, you know, quick reference numbers, uh, about $1.2 billion of operating cash flow, uh, which I think is an interesting metrics. Uh, in terms of um, uh, EBITDA multiple, I mean, depending on, you know, what you're using, we're probably, uh, you know, at about five to six times, uh, which is pretty low, I mean, for equities and in particular gold equities, which is currently, you know, extremely, uh, extremely low. Uh, interestingly, we probably have one of the highest cash flow yield in the sector, uh, you know, between 12 to 15%, uh, you know, thanks to the low cost of the portfolio. Uh, and I think that's probably the attractiveness of this, uh, you know, of this stock, uh, you know, pretty cheap compared to the level of cash flow it's generating. I'd like to go into the history uh, a little bit. Uh, it never grew out of uh, a private financial consultancy. Uh, similarly called Endeavor. So if you could tell me something about the genesis uh, of that, how, as an example, uh, a group of finance guys who could have operated anywhere in the world chose Africa, uh, and whether or not there were any lessons that were applicable uh, from an investor-led consultancy into an operating mining company. And then when you're done with that, if you can remember all these questions, <clears throat> tell us a bit about Semifo, which I think has its own very interesting history. In effect, a French Canadian company uh, operating in French West Africa. Uh, tell me about the corporate cultures from both those companies and how they came together to cause endeavor. And tell me too whether or not you think that there are any lessons uh, in that genesis for investors. Sure. So if we start, I mean, with the uh, you know genesis of endeavor, as you said, I mean, it started as uh, um, a bunch of uh, Canadians uh, and uh, financial. Uh, guy starting uh, Endeavor Financing, uh, which was doing more consultancy, uh, brokerage, M&A uh, in, uh, in the mining sector. Um, they finally decided back in 2010, I mean, to start acquiring directly assets and uh, operating assets. Uh, and um, back in 2015, uh, I was at the time CEO of La Mancha, which is a holding, uh, holding company uh, for the Saweris family. Uh, and uh, we basically uh, had uh, at La Mancha assets in Australia uh, and assets in Africa. Uh, at the time, the decision I took was to split the Australian assets from the African assets in order to not tint the Australian assets from discounted value uh, from the African assets and decided to vend in the Australian asset into evolution mining and to help build evolution mining as a, a large dedicated Australian gold producer. Uh, so we vend in our Australian assets. We took La Mancha, took 30% of Evolution Mining, and we helped them grow progressively from, uh, I would say, $800 million market cap to uh, up to $7 billion uh, market cap, uh, buying Lake Coal from uh, uh, Barrick and then Ernst Henry, uh, the uh, copper gold mine uh, with Glencore. And progressively, as uh, Evolution Mining was growing, we were reducing our exposure to evolution mining in order to focus on Africa. And we did something similar with La Mancha, taking our uh, Cote d'Ivoire asset, ET mine, uh, that we vend in with cash into Endeavor mining back in 2016 and took 30% of Endeavor. And the objective at the time, Endeavor was at the time a $300 million market cap company with $300 million of debt, net debt, uh, with a very interesting project in, uh, in Burkina Faso called Hunde. Uh, that the team at the time couldn't finance. So we basically, as La Mancha came in, uh, with enough you know, capital and cash to help and support the development of the Hunde project, uh, and decided with uh, Nagib Sawaris that um, you know, I should, rather than just invest in companies, I should go and run Endeavor Mining. Um, and I was uh, you know, uh, appointed uh, in, uh, in June 2016 as CEO of Endeavor, with a view to completely turn around and grow quickly Endeavor Mining as a, a leading African gold producer. Um, so the way you do that is basically by refocusing on the right you know, type of assets. Uh, so Endeavor Mining had 
I would say um, assets with uh, short mine life, high cost. Those are the ones you want to sell. And you want to focus on building you know, proper assets that are what I would call assets, uh, which fits into my magic box. And what I call the magic box is basically plus 10 years mine life and below 900 all in sustaining cost. That's the type of assets that you want. Uh, so any assets that was outside that magic box you know, would be for sale. Uh, and the ones that could get into uh, were the ones you need to focus on. And we decided to either build those assets, uh, which we do is the uh, uh, Hyundai project uh, back in 2017-18, uh, which is now a man which is doing about 250, 275,000 ounces a year in terms of production at a very low oil in sustaining cost. And we did it just after again with ET uh, by you know, building a significant mine in Cote d'Ivoire, again, 250, 275,000 ounces annual production at uh, 750, 800 oil in sustaining cost. Uh, once we had built those two mines uh, and exploration has been at the heart of our development, uh, we then thought, oh, uh, interestingly, all the majors are moving outside of uh, West Africa. Uh, so this is the time for us, I mean, to consolidate our position there, because we do believe there is still, you know, a lot to be discovered in, uh, in, uh, in West Africa. And, uh, and we took the opportunity to consolidate uh, both Semafo uh, and then Chiranga. Um, so if I move I mean, to Semaphore, which was your second question, uh, you know, Semaphore was always on our radar because it's been, as you said, I mean, a French Canadian um, operating company exclusively focused on West Africa. They had operations in the past in Guinea, in Niger, and in Burkina Faso. Um, that went through, I would say, um, difficulties uh, back in 2000, uh, 2019 uh, when they faced uh, an, an accident uh, where uh, one of their um, cars transporting, uh, buses transporting, uh, some of the staff was, uh, was attacked. Uh, and uh, on that basis, I think there was a, a sort of a realization, you know, from the Semaphore team that being a single, I mean, two assets in one single country uh, was, you know, risky uh, in emerging countries like, uh, like Africa. And therefore, teaming up and, uh, and, and getting acquired by Endeavor, which was, uh, spread over several countries in West Africa was something of interest for them. Uh, and this is, you know, the genesis, this was the genesis of our discussion with Semaphore. At the heart of our strategy for Endeavor, we like to say that we are highly focused geographically in West Africa, but at the same time diversified over several countries and several assets. Uh, hence the fact that we are the largest gold producer in Senegal, we are the largest gold producer in Côte d'Ivoire, we are the largest producer in Burkina Faso, uh, we've got projects and exploration in Mali, in Guinea. So we like the spread all across those countries. So uh, I think it's fair to say that you've been um, agnostic uh, between buying and building. Uh, you've tended to go where you saw the opportunities, uh, irrespective. The strategy has been uh, opportunistic. Let's talk more about Africa. Uh, it, it was interesting in listening to you. Uh, it, it sounds very much uh, like uh, what the Randgold people would have said. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was involved uh, as an investor in Randgold for 20 years, and your discussion of the risks and the opportunities sounded very much like Bristow uh, 10 years ago, another successful uh, West African, now international company. Let's talk about uh, West Africa. Let's talk about the risks. Let's talk about the opportunity. Let's talk about uh, operating in a place like Burkina Faso that most people can't pronounce. Uh, and if they know about it, know only about uh, Islamic uh, activists attacking mines. Tell us about the challenges and the opportunities and tell us why you've remained focused in Africa. Sure. I like, I like the comparison, I must say, by, uh, you know, with Rengold because, uh, uh, we, um, I mean, we do have, uh, I do have, you know, a, a very good relationship with Mark, uh, which is much more experienced than, uh, than us. Uh, he's been focusing also in, uh, in, in that part of the world uh, when he started uh, and then moved also to DRC. Um, what, what is interesting there is, and, uh, and, and Mark kindly, when we did our listing in London, kindly did a video for us, uh, uh, very kindly, uh, saying that, uh, you know, he felt that Endeavor was the new Rangold. Uh, you know, from from Bristol himself, you know, mm -hmm. was pretty, uh, you know, very very kind of it. Um, I think it's also because we have a bit the same uh, the same ethos and the same way to operate, uh, which is by promoting local talents and uh, and and creating the environment uh, with all the stakeholders in the countries where we operate 
uh, I think, the right way. Um, one thing which is unique about, um, about Africa is obviously you need to love Africa and you need to, uh, you know, to spend time there. Uh, I recall having, not mentioning his name, but uh, a call from uh, the CEO of a very, very large gold company uh, facing difficulties in uh, one country in West Africa and asking you know, some advice on how to better manage his relationship with the government. And I told him, you know, how many times are you going there? And he said, well, I try to go once a year. Uh, I said, yes, and I guess you're probably taking your private plane, landing in the airport in the capital city, and basically letting know the president that you have three or four hours, you know, to spend here before going back to something far more important in, uh, in New York or in London or elsewhere. Well, this is the end of the story with your relationship with the president, because how do you think he's going to react? I mean, you're basically operating in his country and you have three or four hours or a day, I mean, to offer, you know, to spend time with him. Uh, well, if you want to try to build the right relationship, you need to spend time there. And if you don't spend time there, you can't build those relationships. Uh, so at Endeavor, I mean, we have most of our management team, which is based in West Africa. And, uh, and I do go with, uh, you know, Marc Morpon, our chief operating officer. We go there once one week every month, uh, you know, to go and see uh, the different stakeholders, whether it is the mine sites or whether it's the, uh, the governments, uh, uh, the unions with whom we talk a lot and so on. So that's, that's an important part. And I think that's, you know, also uh, something that was special to, uh, you know, to Mark Bristow uh, when he was operating at, uh, at Rengold. In terms of, you know, what is it about, you know, operating in, in West Africa? I think the key for Endeavor is we've been focusing on uh, French West Africa. Um, you know, partly because I'm French and some of us in the management team are French, which is also help, helping, uh, but not just because it's French West Africa, it's also because it's the biggest part of the, uh, you know, Bérimian Greenstone Belt, this geological belt, uh, which is in, in those French West African countries. But also what is very interesting and sometimes unknown is that all those French West African countries, they are part of the same economic zone. Uh, and as part of the same economic zone, they have the same currency. Uh, so you're basically moving from any of the countries where we operate, uh, they have the same currency, which is the French CFA, which is pegged and also fixed parity with the Euro. Uh, so it's not like you've got huge volatility uh, into, uh, uh, into this. Uh, they've got one central bank for all those countries. Uh, obviously it's very easy, I mean, to move, you know, people, goods and everything uh, within this economic zone uh, because of the freedom of movement uh, into it. Uh, and this economic zone is building itself, you know, progressively and being very strong and therefore aligning progressively uh, all their um, tax laws, mining codes and so on, uh, which are progressively uh, more and more the same across all that region. Uh, so once you're there, you know, it's very easy to operate and to move from one country to the other. Um, so if you take, you know, very strong geological potential, uh, not many competitors, I would say big competitors, uh, very interesting, uh, I would say, economic zone and, and ease, I mean, to operate. Uh, we do have a model where we have our own planes in West Africa. So if you take, uh, you know, we've got our regional headquarters, which is in Abidjan, and it takes between one to two hours to reach any of our mines, you know, from Abidjan. Um, we are in the same time zone, uh, you know, from Paris, you know, the headquarters are based in London, but from Paris, you've got uh, up to two or three flights a day, I mean, to Côte d'Ivoire, to Abidjan. Uh, so very easy to go there. And I recall that, uh, you know, during the pandemic uh, with COVID, uh, we were still able to go every month, you know, to sites uh, and in the countries where we operate. Uh, and if I take, you know, some of our peers, which are based out of Canada, of Australia, you know, for two years, nearly two years, they were not able, I mean, to move out of their country and therefore not able to go at all, I mean, to mine sites or to interact with the governments where they operate. Uh, so that's also what we like is being, highly focused geographically in a very, very prolific area, uh, which is, you know, from um, an economic environment uh, is extremely supportive. Um, so to your point on how is it to operate in Burkina Faso? Well, you know, the, uh, the security issues first on, uh, on, on Burkina Faso and, and the big part of our zone are quite located. Uh, so if you take Burkina Faso, it's, uh, you know, mainly the north part of Burkina and the east part of Burkina. Uh, so, uh, uh, all of our sites, probably except one, you know, are in, in very safe area uh, for all that region, whether in Burkina, if you take Côte d'Ivoire, it's a very, very safe country. Senegal is probably the safest in, in the entire West Africa. Um, so, 
it's all about you know setting up the right uh, you know security team sec setting up you know the right protocols but also having the right interaction and relationships uh, you know because we're french we also have you know strong relationship with the uh, uh, the French government and and the Barkhane force, which are you know deployed in the in the in the, in the region, uh, we've got very good relationship with the governments. And if you take country like Burkina, um, gold is you know one of the primary resources, which means that it's critical for them to ensure that mines are able to operate and are not uh, you know disturbed. I would say by a so-called terrorist group. I said so-called because in in a lot of cases, not even terrorist group. It's really bandits, uh, which are. Uh, you know, trafficking, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, smuggling, you know, uh, drugs, uh, uh, cigarettes and stuff like that. Um, so there is a strong support from governments, I mean, to help ensure that uh, mines can operate uh, because they are critical. Uh, if you take Burkina Faso, I think we are the largest private employer in the country. Uh, so we are a very strong partner, I mean, for the government. Uh, and we have those those amazing relationships. You know, I used to say that uh, there is not many countries where you can come, I can fly on a day in Burkina and meet in the same day, I can meet the Minister of Mine, the Minister of Finance, the Prime Minister, Minister of Defense, and the President in one day. You know, can you imagine how long it would take me if I would try, you know, to do that in the US, for example? Probably, you know, wouldn't be required, but you know, would be impossible. Uh, so that's also, you know, the ease and the proximity uh, when you are building those relationship and be seen as a true partner for all those countries. Uh, I want to talk about local community development. Uh, too often <clears throat> in the mining business, the, uh, <laughs> the saying in English is that the capital gets the rent and the regions get the shaft, uh, which is to say too often as an industry, uh, we have left local communities bereft, uh, taking the minerals and leaving. Talk something about building local economies and build lo building local societies in areas where, as you suggest, the only economic outlet is mining. Yeah, so I think, I mean, you're, you're completely right. And, uh, you know, the interesting part is, you know, all this um, ESG uh, theme in the market uh, is, uh, is something that uh, some people seems to discover, uh, which hasn't been, you know, a new discovery, I mean, for some industries and, and, and the right industries probably you know, natural resources in emerging markets, uh, because we had, you know, for years, uh, what we called at the time this license to operate. And what we call the license to operate is basically ensuring that um, uh, you do have this proximity with communities and governments uh, to basically allow you to operate and to develop your projects and to operate safely your projects, so that you've got the right balance into sharing, you know, the profits of those natural resources uh, with the different uh, stakeholders not just governments, because you need to ensure that the communities also around are benefiting, uh, you know, and you've got basically different levels, you know, to ensure that those communities benefit from it. Um, so the first one is more and more governments have put in place what they call uh, local, uh, local fund. Uh, so basically you have, you know, part of your turnover, uh, which is contributed to a local fund. Uh, so in most of the countries where we operate, it's about 1% of our turnover. Uh, which is contributed in a local fund uh, that will serve uh, only uh, into projects for the communities uh, that are around uh, around the mines. And those projects are decided on uh, you know tripartite level. Uh, so the mine is part of that fund. Uh, the other one is the local uh, um, the local uh, mayor or uh, or um, or governor, and the other part is uh, NGOs and, and and local associations. And they decide all together which projects to allocate the funds that are uh, into this local fund. Uh, but the other part, because sometimes you know you don't have full control on that, uh, is making sure that uh, you know from day one you do the right things in terms of recruitment and employment. And I think that is where you can make a big difference. Uh, is you know if I take you know all the projects that we've been doing, each time we we basically hire people uh, which don't know how to drive to make them you know truck drivers. Uh, you know, and can be surprising, but uh, you know we've got uh, amazing results. In particular, with uh, with the women, uh, which are you know sometimes taking much more care, uh, in fact, of the equipments uh, that you're giving them, uh, and that are you know so happy. I mean, to grow and uh, and take those uh, take those opportunities. So it's all about the system ecosystem that you're building uh, around the mine uh, that makes 
you know, the region uh, then prosperous uh, and that allows you then to, you know, stay, you know, for longer uh, because of this, you know, trust uh, and partnership that you're building with the, uh, the stakeholders. You know, Seb, one of the things that uh, I've learned in 45 years of investing in extractive industries is uh, it's as much about people as resources. And one of the things that I've noticed uh, is the necessity of having a supporting shareholder who is at once a large patient shareholder, but also provides adult supervision. Uh, I've learned time and time again that, a, you know, a Jim Bob Moffat or a, a Robert Friedland or an Adolf or then a Lucas Lundin uh, has been important as to whether or not I achieve success. When they look after their interests, they look after mine. If you could talk about uh, the Suarez family, uh, how that family fortune came to exist, uh, about their Africa uh, focus, and about their company building activities, uh, including their mining activities. I think that's an important part of your story. Sure. I, I refer to it as adult supervision. Not that yeah. you require it, but it's always handy from an investor's point of view to know that it's there. Uh, it's it's been. I mean, you, you couldn't say it differently. I mean, Rick, it's uh, it's been you know uh, absolutely critical. I think in uh, you know in our development. Uh, I don't know if you can call it a success. I mean, I think it's others. I mean, to judge whether it's a success or not so far. But uh, you know, clearly, Nagib Sawaris has been completely instrumental in uh, uh, in in helping me and supporting you know throughout the years in building this company. Um, so maybe a bit of background on the Sawaris family. It's an amazing, uh, uh, so uh, Christian Coptic uh, Egyptian family. Uh, they've been, uh, um, you've got three brothers uh, and uh, Nagib is the elder. And the three brothers uh, are billionaires in three different businesses. You know, that's, you know, uh, pretty astonishing. I mean, you don't have a lot of families like that uh, where you are able to build from scratch. You know, can you imagine, you know, parents must be, you know, pretty proud of their children <laughs> when you create, you know, children which are able to build their own business and uh, and be billionaires in, in three different ones. Uh, so Nagib the Elder uh, made a fortune in telecom. Uh, his group was uh, Orascom Telecom, uh, which had, uh, you know, uh, more than 300 million subscribers uh, with number five or number six in the world. Uh, obviously, a lot of operations in, uh, in Africa, but also with... Um, the owner of uh, um, uh, the second largest Italian uh, mobile company. Uh, so he made a good success and in 2012 decide, he decided to sell his telecom group uh, by merging it and then selling to Vimpelcom, uh, a Russian uh, telecom operator. Uh, and at the time he wanted to reinvest part of his wealth, uh, several billions. Uh, he wanted to reinvest part of it in natural resources and preferably in Africa because uh, he's, you know, African being Egyptian, you know, he always felt that uh, he wanted to invest further uh, into Africa. And this is how we met back in 2012 with the view to create through the Mancha, uh, a dedicated vehicle into investing into gold mining. And what was, uh, you know, amazing is, uh, you know, the first four years, you know, we did those transactions with Evolution Mining and then with Endeavor Mining. Uh, but uh, he was incredibly supportive when uh, uh, the objective was to turn around and to grow Endeavor Mining. Uh, so the way you know you do it is um, having a strong shareholder which is able to respond, you know, very quickly. So I would send an SMS, you know, to Nagib saying we've got an opportunity. Uh, you know, uh, shall we do it? Yes, do it, and then done. <laughs> you know, so the speed and 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 as you said, probably at the beginning. Uh, the ability to move, you know, fast and seize opportunities, you know, requires sometimes, you know, a short decision process. So when you have a strong shareholder uh, like uh, like Nagib, which is highly entrepreneurial, uh, you know, the discussion can be done very fast and the decision can be done, can be taken, you know, very fast. Uh, he's been an amazing supporter each time we needed more capital, each time we were doing a transaction, he was then had this uh, anti-dilution right, allowing him to put back money into the company to maintain his shareholding. And therefore through that helping us, I mean, to deleverage, you know, the balance sheet as we were building projects. Uh, so it's been a, you know, a phenomenal relationship. Uh, I, I can say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's been a partner and a friend. Uh, so it's really friendship, which has been created through that. Uh, and, and as you said, I think it's the case, you know, with the London, uh, you know, when they're shareholders, uh, I think that when you have, you know, the luck of being backed, you know, by, you know, strong uh, entrepreneurs, uh, which have, you know, strong views and prepared to support you. Uh, it's just amazing. 
I, I want to go a little further down this adult, adult supervision theme. My favorite part of the presentation in Zurich uh, was Endeavor's stated policy of measuring their progress on a per share basis, which is to say net asset value per share, free cash flow per share. per share. Too many mining companies are built on a gross basis, and I mean gross literally and figuratively where the management team is perfectly willing to sacrifice shareholder interest in terms of dilution to build mass uh, rather than on a per share basis. If you could talk about uh, the fact that you view your progress on a per share basis, I, I think that would be very useful in setting you apart from many, I would say almost all of your competitors. And I think you're right, Rick. I think the, uh, you know, when you've got in particular uh, a strong shareholder, which is an entrepreneur, I mean, somehow he's looking after the interest, I mean, for all shareholders, because uh, he knows that what is right for him is right for the other shareholders. Uh, and, uh, and, and it probably helps to avoid, you know, having, you know, lifestyle companies, uh, which are just, you know, taking, you know, uh, all shareholders money, I mean, for their own interest and uh, ensuring, you know, their lifestyle, you know, over time. Here it's all about results, uh, and the results you've got different metrics. I mean, to uh, uh, to analyze uh, the results, uh, and a big one which we've been focused since day one is uh, uh, metrics per share, uh, whether it's uh, free cash flow per share. But other key metrics that we've been using, you know, since day one is uh, uh, return on capital employed. I think that's uh, you know a key metrics that uh, some companies have been uh, you know losing, uh, and and the reason why I've been insisting internally on return on capital employed and uh, targeting above 20% return on capital employed is because um, when you're addressing uh, to generalist funds, uh, you know, you just need to recount that, uh, you know, those generalist funds have the opportunity to invest in any sectors. Uh, so you need to be able to position yourself compared to any other businesses. It's not because you're gold, you know, that, uh, you know, generalist funds are going to buy your stock. Uh, you know, they're still going to compare, you know, should I buy, you know, gold equities or should I buy tech companies or should I buy, you know, defensive, you know, other defensive sectors? Uh, so how do you compare yourself? And I think a good metrics is, you know, can I generate, you know, above 20% return on capital employed? And if I can do that, then I'm able to, you know, speak at par with other sectors, uh, you know, with generalist funds. So yeah, key metrics per share in order to justify whether, the decisions that you're taking, uh, for example, you know, acquiring assets, uh, acquiring companies, are you doing it just, you know, for the sake of being, you know, bigger for the sake of bigger and an and ego for the CEO to be able to say, I'm the CEO of a larger company, uh, you know, no one cares. Uh, you know, I've done that when I was in much larger, uh, you know, companies, uh, what you want to do when, uh, and, and that's my, my approach today is making sure that the decision we're taking uh, is the right decisions, you know, for shareholders. I'm myself a shareholder, uh, and therefore I want to make sure that all the decisions we're doing are the right ones. So bringing it home, uh, I think when we look at Endeavor as a whole, <clears throat> we're uh, struck first by a 20-year track record of success. Uh, we come away understanding that it's an Africa-focused company. <clears throat> we understand, too, that the asset base is long-lived companies with probably best quartile AISC and also simultaneously uh, best quartile return on capital employed. Uh, and we're struck by the fact that there is in fact adult supervision, a, a dominant shareholder, which explains a lot of your success to date. Uh, tell us how this franchise is going to reward shareholders in the future. How do you grow? Where do you go from here? Sure. Well, I think the, the, the important step for us was about uh, 18 months ago, where after investing close to a billion dollars into the business uh, in exploration and building key mines like the Hyundai one and the Ichi one, um, you know, we wanted to deleverage, you know, very quickly at the peak of the construction at the end of the uh, second project, Ichi, um, we had close to um, $600 million net debt. And given the quality of the assets and being extremely low cost, we've been in 18 months able to completely uh, deleverage the balance sheet, which shows you know the level of cash flow that the company is able to to generate in particular. So, wait, wait, wait! Give that to my listeners one more time. You've generated 600 million dollars in free cash in 18 months. So, so we we are we are currently, uh, but at the time, yes, we generated about 600 million dollars of net cash in in less than 18 months. Uh, you know, following the two acquisitions, we're probably generating before dividend, but after tax and everything, 
probably generating about $700 million of net free cash flow a year. Uh, so significant cash flow, uh, which allows us to continue to invest in the business, in particular if we're able to still maintain above 20% return on capital employed. Uh, but also it means that today, I mean, at the end of Q1, we were net cash positive $175 million. Uh, so we've been able to initiate last year, uh, you know, a dividend program uh, in order to start rewarding shareholders, which have been, you know, backing us since the, uh, since the beginning. Um, in a form of um, a return program of value to shareholders uh, with both dividends and buyback. Uh, so the way we structure it is uh, simply ensuring that over the next three years, I mean, to start with, you know, the next three years, uh, a minimum growing dividend every year, uh, which was uh, $125 million for last year, $150 for this year, $175 for next year, based on a minimum of $1,500 gold price. And if we are above 1500 gold price, having the ability to increase that dividend uh, by way of either increasing the dividend and on top of that, doing some buybacks. So just to give an example, last year, we committed to a minimum of $125 million of dividend. In reality, we distributed $140 million. But on top of that, we did $140 million of buybacks. So about $280 million of returns to value to shareholders. Uh, and this year, we intend to do the same, given where the gold price is. You know, we have um, a lot of flexibility uh, in order to continue uh, to reward shareholders uh, by ways of increasing dividends and, uh, and buybacks. And I think it's even more important in an environment where I'm sure Rick, you'll agree with me that, uh, you know, gold equities remain extremely undervalued. Uh, so, you know, the best way, you know, to continue to reward shareholders is by increasing those programs uh, of dividends and buybacks. Uh, what I want to hear, in addition to the fact that you're generous enough to give me some of my money back, is <clears throat> how you intend to grow or at least maintain production after that return on capital, uh, which you kindly distribute to its owners. <laughs> so the objective is that now that we've reached a, a very sound balance sheet, is uh, cont continue to be highly disciplined on the production cost uh, to maintain a strong visibility on our cash flow going forward so that this you know, a program that we initiated is going to continue, uh, hopefully, for the next uh, the next few years. And in parallel, uh, we are investing a lot in the business. Uh, so we're now investing uh, $80 million in exploration a year uh, because, again, of the prospectivity of the geological environment. We did something quite unique uh, back in 2016 when I joined Endeavor. We said that um, we're going to invest for the next five years, uh, which was up to last year, we're going to invest $40 million in exploration a year. But more importantly, we are going to find between 10 to 15 million ounces of indicated resources. So that was quite unique at the time because you've got a lot of companies that are telling you, I'm going to invest in exploration, but no idea what I'm going to discover. Uh, so <laughs> it's like, you know, a coin and, you know, hopefully it falls on the right thing. But given the high prospectivity of the environment and the tenements that we had, uh, we were able to say upfront, okay, we're going to invest $40 million, but more importantly, we will find between 10 to 15 million ounces of indicated resources. And in fact, last year was the end of this five-year program. And sorry, we discovered over the five years about 11.5 million, 11 .5 million ounces of indicated resources, so right in the range that we announced five years back into it. And you know, some people at the time were saying, oh, well, maybe, maybe the, those answers are not very attractive answers. Well, they are extremely attractive because most of the answers that we found were in fact at higher grade than the reserve grade of the existing projects. Uh, so in fact, very valuable resources. And that just demonstrated you know, the quality of the exploration in, the, in West Africa. So for the next five years, we're gonna double up. And we said, we're gonna now for the next five years, given the bigger size since the acquisition of Semaphore and Tranga, we're going to invest $80 million a year in exploration with a view to find between 15 to 20 million ounces of indicated resources over the next five years. Uh, so hopefully in five years time, I'll be able to come back here, Rick, and say that uh, we did it. Um, so we've got you know, a, lot of, a lot going on in exploration. Uh, we've got a nice organic growth pipeline uh, with two projects that we are launching in terms of contraction. Uh, the first one was announced uh, back in, in, in April, which is the expansion of the Sabadola Masawa mine in Senegal, which will allow, I mean, through the treatment of refractory ore, high-grade refractory ore, to increase production from 350,000 ounces a year to about 400, 450,000 ounces a year at very low oil in sustaining cost. I mean, talking about 700 oil in sustaining costs, a very, very attractive project. 
And then we are about to finalize DFS for our Greenfield uh, Lafigue project in Cote d'Ivoire, which will be again about 200, 250,000 ounces for the next 10 years at below 850 all in. So we've got you know, this strong pipeline of organic growth, a lot of exploration. And as you saw in the previous years, if there are some good opportunities in the market to acquire, we'll do it as long as the per share metrics you know, is uh, positively impacted. So I've been torturing you for about 50 minutes now, and it's probably time for me to cease and desist, although I could talk to you for days. Uh, <laughs> tell our listeners uh, how they can get in touch uh, with Endeavor and who they should get in touch with when they have more questions, which would lead to an investment decision. Sure. I think the, uh, you know, the best option is our IR, IR team, uh, you know, Martino uh, De Ciccio, which is the uh, uh, VP IR, uh, who was at the conference and that you met and their team, uh, you know, with Jack's great, great, you know, people to start conversation and, uh, uh, you know, you can find their uh, emails on the website uh, and uh, very easy to contact. And I, you know, as CEO would be more than happy, I mean, to organize follow up calls with some of those, you know, investors interested into following our story. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for the great success which our investors have enjoyed as shareholders of yours. And thank you too for your support of the Natural Resources Investment Symposium. Thank you very much, Rick.